to another dimension. A dimension of insight. A dimension of understanding. You are entering a place where reality collides with truth. There are no limits. There are no boundaries. This is Off Planet Radio. I'm Randy Moggins. We've got a great show lined up for tonight and some exciting changes as well. Very pleased at the way things have really shaped up over the last few months in terms of how we're doing the show and the people that are coming on and uh, lots of exciting things going on. It is Wednesday, the 15th of May, 2013. Next week, um, my guests will be Kathleen Martin and Denise Stoner, and we're going to talk about this new book that just came out. In fact, I, I just finished reading it. It, I think, is being released on Monday. The Alien Abduction Files, the most startling cases of human-alien contact ever reported. Both of them are veteran uh, investigators. I think both are MUFON investigators. And Kathleen Martin is the niece of Betty Hill, of Betty and Barney Hill, probably what is the original abduction case back in the 1970s. And um, it's going to be a pretty interesting two hours. Chris Holly will not be here next week, but she is here tonight, and uh, she is my co-host on this show now. And so uh, good evening and welcome, Chris. Well, good evening, Randy, and I am very pleased to be here. And tonight with us, we have Ken Pfeiffer, who is of the site World UFO Photos and News, which is a wonderful site. He'll tell us how to uh, get to it later. And is a chief MUFON investigator for New Jersey. So, Randy, this has got to be a great show. Oh, it's going to be ripping. Um, by the way, for those of you who are on the chat and uh, on the uh, stream at offplanetradio.net, not to be confused with offplanetradio.com, there is a link underneath the marquee, which is the graphic that announces each week's show. And it is slide gallery for tonight's show. There are photos there that are uploaded to the site. You can just click on that link, and there's a slideshow there. This will be material that Ken is going to discuss over the course of the show tonight. Um, we're going to find out more about Ken. We're going to find out about his activities as an investigator about what motivates him to do what he does. And we're going to talk a little bit about the state of ufology and uh, research and investigation. Uh, Ken, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Uh, yes, hi. It's, a, it's an honor to be on your show. It's, uh, it's actually uh, my privilege to have you on tonight. Um, we've not done a lot of what I guess I would call hard investigative research over the years. And I was excited when I saw your site, Ken, because you literally have just, I don't know, how many photos do you actually have on your various sites? First, tell people your websites so that they can find them, and then let's talk a little bit about the content of those sites. Well, my main website is uh, worldufophotos.org. Uh, I started that that website a few years ago. Uh, I believe it's about three or four years now, and uh, I was basically tired of going to a dozen different uh, UFO websites to find pictures. So one day I sat down and decided to uh, put all the photos on, on, uh, on one website. So it's been working out real well. Um, I try to put three or four new photos on my site every day. And I approximately have uh, well over 5,000 photos right now. Now, of course, this includes photos of the moon. I have some strange photos. I have photos of um, strange things on the moon and Mars. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of different galleries I have on on my site. You, you have to check it out. It, it's uh, it, it may take you quite a while to get through it, but it's the kind of site that I feel that a lot of people can always go to if they saw something in the sky and and were not sure you know what it was or if they're not sure how to draw it properly, they may be able to find a similar um, 
photo on my site, so at least I'll have something to compare. So I'm 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 excited about it. Tell us a little bit about your background, Ken, how you became interested in UFOs, your history with UFOs, and a little bit about your background as well. Well, I was, uh, essentially, I was born in Philadelphia, raised in National Park. Now, National Park is a very small town on the Delaware River, and it's right. directly across the, the river from the Philadelphia International Airport and also the uh, Philadelphia Naval Yard. So as a child, you know, we moved there when I was seven years old, so I've been basically, you know, looking up into the sky every day as a child just to see the airplanes flying over. And as a matter of fact, I believe at that time, the uh, the Philadelphia Naval Yard, they had a reserve unit over there. Of uh, They had F-102 uh, fighter planes that used to uh, basically come over my, my house uh, before they landed at the airport. So I've always been interested in... in uh, you know, aeronautics, airplanes, and, and the stars. I'm a stargazer from, from uh, as long as I can remember. We, uh, as a matter of fact, we stood on the front, my front lawn there in, in October of 2007, and, and uh, I'm sorry, 1957, and watched uh, Sputnik fly over. So uh, I remember standing out there with my mom and dad, and, and we uh, we saw it. So, you know, I've always been interested in space and, and UFOs and, and, and everything else, uh, you know, it, it then then all of a sudden I, I really had my first sighting in 1974, and this uh, really got me interested in, in UFOs. Tell me a little bit about that sighting. Where was it? And uh, let's see, 1974. Yeah, that's about right. There was a lot of activity in the, the skies of the East Coast through the 60s and the, and the 70s. Certainly through, I would say, the mid 1970s. I live here in uh, southern central Pennsylvania and as a kid growing up I repeatedly saw uh, numerous well <laughs> that's that's scratching the surface but numerous craft that passed over this area oh that's great that's cool no I was in well back in 74 we were um, I was on my way home from I was with a friend and we were on our way home from a club in South Jersey there uh, heading down driving down Route uh, 295 Interstate 295 South and we come to a a circle uh, on 295. It's not actually a circle, but it's a, a portion of the road where you have to slow down. It's it's in the Belmar uh, area of South Jersey, and, and mm -hmm. also mm -hmm. so within the uh, the TCA, the Terminal Control Area of Philadelphia International Airport. So we, uh, me and my friend, I was in the, in the passenger seat, and we were. It was about maybe 2:30 in the morning. We were, we were we had to slow down coming around this bend, and, and as soon as we came out from under the overpass, I, I looked up and I saw a very large, it was a turquoise, bluish-green turquoise-colored disc that was just peeking out of the, the overcast. Uh, there was, a, I guess there was about a 200-foot ceiling that night, and it was just, it was glowing. It was very, very bright and glowing, and, and you know, it was. I, I saw it for a brief moment for, for maybe a second or two, and, and then with us still you know, driving in the car, and, and this thing just, just disappeared into the overcast, and and I was excited. My friend didn't see it, but uh, we drove around <laughs> We drove around most of the night looking for this thing, and and uh, the next day in the, uh, I believe it was the Woodbury Times, they had an article about some witnesses and a few different police uh, who saw the object. So um, I'm, I'm kind of glad that I had some uh, some other witnesses to, to the event, but that was, uh, and ever since that, that really... Uh, that really got me going on on uh, looking for these UFOs. You know, you're the second person I've talked to from that area, uh, the, the Philadelphia, Jersey, South Jersey area, that's related stories about uh, sightings in that area in that particular time period. And again, it kind of coincides with what I think was going on in the skies in that particular period from my memories mid 1960s as a kid through the mid 1970s growing up as a teenager and um it, it's just amazing to me because today a lot of people overlook the fact that the some of the earliest flaps in the united states actually were occurring uh, between washington dc and uh, the atlantic seacoast yeah, I, I have to just jump in here and say you're absolutely right because I was on Long Island at that time and it was just incredible the amount of UFO activity during those years. 
that took place where I lived, including my own, which was in 1963. And I also had one, it's, it's very interesting, in, in 1974. So this is, you know, extremely like hitting home for me. Yeah, it is for me too. Um, very affirming that there was that much activity going on in that, in that period of time. Ken, you also are a pilot and have a military background, and I think uh, it would be important to also let people know about that because a lot of times, um, well, pilots have an acuity for what's really in the skies because they're trained to watch what's going on outside of them. Oh, and yeah. I, I consider pilots to be a, an asset untapped in UFOlogy. Uh, yeah, you're right. As a matter of fact, I think some of the most important sightings out there these days are, are the sightings from Air Force pilots or Navy pilots uh, that have, uh, you know, had encounters with UFOs. You know, if, if these guys are going to come forward and, and tell tell the, the public what they saw, I mean, that's, that takes a lot of nerve and a lot of guts because, as you know, as you know, the government would, would want to, uh, to, to hide uh, all of these sightings that they have, but... Uh, I, yeah, I'm a private pilot myself. I I, uh, I served six years in the uh, Army National Guard 50th Armored Division back in in the early 70s, and and I also served uh, uh, nine years in McGuire Air Force Base and two years at Dover Air Force Base. And of course, we got activated for for Desert Storm, and and uh, so uh, basically, my job is is essentially my job is what we did is we loaded the cargo planes for the troops overseas and. And also, uh, I was also an evaluator. What I did is I, uh, I was in a section called SEQC, which means that we, uh, I would go around and evaluate the 20 different sections in our squadron just to make sure they were performing everything to uh, Air Force regulations and also making uh, uh, comments or, or helping out as to, you know, how they can make their section run better. So, uh, yeah, I decided to, to get out of the Air Force. I was... Um, really spending with my work I was spending too much time with work and, and being at the Air Force so being at at the Air Force Base in McGuire almost every weekend um, so I, I wanted to spend some more time with my family and my son he was you know in high school so I just decided to uh, just decided to get out and, and uh, then I uh, finally decided I, I joined MUFON in, in uh, around 2006 and started investigating for George Filer of course you know George he's the um um, Eastern Director and, and State Director for New Jersey, and you know the follow files of George Fowler. So he, yeah. he's my boss out of Mefford. So uh, yeah, I I, re I really enjoy the the military. I, I uh, my son, as a matter of fact, uh, thank God he's home now. But he's also he's the fourth generation of the Pipers who have been in the military. He was in uh, Mosul, Iraq, for nine for eight months as a 50 cal gunner for the Big Red One. Uh, during the time they were invading uh, Baghdad, so uh, thank God he he got through all that and he's home and and uh, he's doing fine also. In your um, in your dealings with pilots, did you ever hear any scuttlebutt from pilots who maybe saw things that they didn't quite comprehend, understand, or were unwilling to talk about? Well, as a matter of fact, I did while I was in the, the in the Air Force, especially McGuire. I was there nine years. I, I just yeah, I did talk to many many pilots. So I was in contact with with uh, most of the pilots who came in, and, and quite frankly, they really said that uh, they didn't see anything. And, and I always got the impression that this was something that they couldn't talk about. Well, and you know, the other side of that's interesting too, because you you were talking about how you. And your friend were out driving around in 1974. You saw the craft. Your friend didn't. And over the years, um, in talking to people who have had any kind of um, uh, experience, anything from sighting craft to anything going close to a CE-3, witnesses in the same situation sometimes don't seem to observe the same things that uh, people who are, let's say, kind of uh, acutely aware do. And I've noticed that you can have two people in the same situation, and yet one person sees something and the other person doesn't. And it almost, 
I don't know. I mean, what, were some of us born kind of attuned to the phenomena that we see things, we observe things, or we're keener observers? What's what's your take on that? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it is really strange because if, if there's a car accident and the first 10 people stand <laughs> on the sidewalk and all these 10 people see this car accident, you're going to get 10 different uh, versions of what happened. Um, I real, I'm not really sure what, what, uh, why, why people see things differently. Uh, um, I guess we're all different and, and uh, different perspectives, and, and uh, I really don't know. Now, you do uh, research for MUFON. Um, is this on the ground going out and doing um, a site observation? Can you give us, give us a little bit of a background on exactly what you do in terms of uh, uh, doing your investigations? Uh, well, essentially with MUFON, I would say that 95% of all of our cases are done over the phone. Okay. Because there's really no need to drive up to, to South to North Jersey and, and get the same information that I would get over the phone. But of course, certain cases require you to um, to go out and, and actually investigate. You know, we'll say like a landing, um, possibly an abduction or something like that. It's the kind of case that you would want to go out and, and get in your car and and, and talk to the uh, the witness and find out some information. But I would say most of it is done over the phone now I am a member of the star team and it basically means that we are sent on high profile cases um, you know throughout the United States and as a matter of fact a few years ago uh, the star team that's when it was uh, being run by um, uh, Bigelow Aeros Aerospace uh, he was paying for uh, invest see we, we are, we're all volunteers we don't get paid anything but he was paying for for our uh, expenses and, and and meals and and hotel stage but uh, they sent me to uh, New London Connecticut for for three days I was out there three for three days because a witness witness had a a sighting a very large black triangle uh, come flying over over his apartment building and um, he was a very credible witness, a business owner, uh, you know, someone who, who I felt that would, would make something up or, or create a hoax. So uh, Newfon and, and the Bigelow decided to send me out to uh, New London, which I went. And, and uh, I did a lot of it. Uh, I did a couple of days of investigating. Uh, now, if you're not aware, New London, Connecticut and Groton, Connecticut, that's where the General Dynamics Corporation is. And that's where they make the nuclear submarines. And that is also where the nuclear submarine pens are. Uh, the uh, let me see, the Coast Guard Academy is there. Uh, they have a control tower airport in Groton, uh, Connecticut, and there's also a. Um, I'm trying to remember, there is a nuclear plant that is basically right on the bay there, not very far from New London, Connecticut. Right, so there's, right. a, there's a lot of high-profile. Um, Things there that that um, personally I, I felt that uh, this this UFO was uh, checking them out and and uh, I don't want to use the word spying but uh, you know I think it was doing some kind of a recon mission uh, you know just flying flying over top of of uh, that area but I inter interviewed many witnesses and uh, quite frankly I didn't get too much cooperation a lot of the guards wouldn't talk to me a lot of them said that they're not allowed to speak about such things I sp I spoke to. Uh, uh, one of the officers on duty there at the police station, and, and he says that, um, you know, he's been here 15 years, and, and he hasn't really gotten any calls about UFOs. And I went up to the, uh, they had a, I have a small paper in New London, Connecticut, and, and they didn't want anything to do with me. I, I sat there in the office for about a, about an hour and finally got to talk to an editor. I was hoping to go upstairs and, and sit down with an editor and talk to them about, the, you know, if they've gotten any strange things or any sightings and, and they just uh, they just didn't want anything to do with me and I, I thought it was very strange it was just um, I just got a strange feeling when I left there I, I don't know what it was but it was uh, it was not normal that's for sure you know that's actually been another aspect of this as well that's baffling um, I'm trying to remember the name of the, uh, the committee that met back in the 1950s but at that time it was decided that um, the press 
and the official line of government military would treat any reports of UFOs as basically lunatic fringe stuff. And that's been the policy of media, mainstream media, for over 50 years now. Even when UFOs get reported, it's almost done at the end of the news with a tagline something like, well, this is our lighter news for the evening. The lack of the lack of a serious attitude towards any of this from the media has in my mind been criminal at this point because it's what they did is they've clamped it down and they've basically used a form of mind control to keep people inside of the media and inside of the military from being first line reporters Uh, oh you're exactly right yeah i've seen the same thing it's it's uh I think it seems that that more uh, we're maybe getting a little bit more uh, uh, attention from the from the media about the UFOs, but like you said, they they kind of shrug this thing off as, as being uh, you know being funny or, or, or comical sometimes. And it's uh, even Larry King did that. As a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, I was watching Larry King, and he had some on some he had some UFO uh, people on there, very knowledgeable. Uh, he had a couple of debunkers on there, and the show was very good. And at the end of Larry King's show, he says, "Oh well, wait till next week. We're going to be having the, uh, I think the World Wrestlers and and the Bigfoot uh, uh, organizations on next week." So he, he kind of let the air out of the balloon. He he kind of blew the whole thing away just by just by saying that essentially. You know, I've said many times, and sorry we've got the trains coming through here right now, and this room's not <laughs> completely soundproof, so you may get trains, airplanes, that, who knows what. Um, I've said over the years that this story, um, the UFOs and specifically the issue of extraterrestrials, is the last great taboo in our culture. Every, almost everything else has been opened up now. We can talk freely in our, in our media about almost anything, but except for the internet where things are just wide open, um, we don't have an open discourse in this country, certainly, and even globally, on the subject of UFOs and extraterrestrials. And it's it's mind-boggling. As you sit and listen to, to this conversation, you have to ask yourself the one question that I have to ask myself all the time is why does the public go along with this? Why is this enough for them? Obviously, people all over are seeing things in the sky all the time. They know they're there, yet they won't talk about it. They are so controlled by the media and the reputation of being, you know, a nut if you report seeing this, that they stay silent and sit in the dark ages about this subject willingly. That's the question because these things are there in our lives whether we like it or not when is the public going to say gee I think I'd be better off if I understood what this thing was and what it wants from me yeah I think our one hope is the internet right now has opened up the throttle on this because mainstream news um really is having the gauntlet laid down to them. It's becoming impossible to ignore, and as internet usage, especially YouTube, goes up, um, <laughs> and and the ratings go down on all of the, uh, the networks, especially the mainstream networks, and even CNN and Fox and, and networks like that, we're beginning to see the tide turn on this. And one of the encouraging aspects of this is that we are starting to get a little bit of open inquiry and uh, you know I guess probably this is a good place to talk about the uh, the citizen hearing on disclosure I I noticed Ken and Chris you both posted this story on uh, former Air Force officers encounters with aliens so let's talk a little bit about your takeaway from last week's citizen hearing on disclosure, what you think it represents, whether you think it's straight up, whether this is uh, some sort of run at co-opting the movement. I'm really interested to know what you think about this. Uh, Chris, uh, what do you, how do you feel about it? I, I don't... I, I, I kind of feel about it the same way I felt when um, 
Robert Bigelow on Easter night came out when no one was around to hear it on, you know, national radio and said, I'm taking over the space program. It's privatized. I'm going to take us, you know, into space, into the space stations. I fight for a base on the moon against China. Oh, and by the way, yes, there are UFOs and aliens. And nothing happened. <laughs> the report, this report, I feel the same way about that to me should be like on the news you know okay people pay attention now you're going to expand your knowledge of the universe you live in listen up and you tell them and they kind of go uh-huh and then that's it <laughs> so I, I i can't put my finger on what's going on with the whole thing i mean to me this is massive important big tremendous news all of it Yet uh, everybody else kind of wants to watch American Idol instead. So you know, help me out here. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, I was all for disclosure uh, years ago, and, and the more I thought about it, um, you know, they say that there's millions of people who have seen UFOs, and you know, there's possibly a million have that have done it, been abducted. But when you think about it. It's really, we are still, we, all the ufologists and the people who believe in UFOs out there, we are still, I feel we're still a very small com community. Let's put, let me put it figure-wise. Let's say 31 million people believe in UFOs. That sounds like a lot, uh, 31 million. Uh, you know, 31 million people believe in UFOs and, you know, have had abductions and experiences and everything else. But when you think about it, uh, that's only one-tenth of the population. You know, and I think there are a lot of people out there who do not believe in UFOs. And, and case in point is if you were to go up to someone and ask them, uh, you know, have you guys ever heard of MUFON? And uh, I've done this myself. And, and you ask them that question, and out of 10 people would say to you, MUFON, what's that? You know, and then you tell them the mutual UFO network. And, you know, um, it's really strange that... Uh, well, of course, more and more people are, are now starting to see UFOs, but, but like I said, I think it's, it's, it's a small group as compared to how many people are in the United States and, of course, how many people are in the world. And I think, uh, I really, I'm afraid that if, if they do disclose, if the president comes on the TV one day and says that, you know, aliens are real, they're, you know, flying over the White House, I think it's going to cause panic. I think the, uh, Stock markets will crash. I, I think. Well, the, the only the only company that would probably make a killing in the stock market would be the gun manufacturers. Because, quite quite frankly, I think the first thing that someone would want to do is go out and buy a gun. You know, don't ask me why. I guess they they they're, they'll they'll feel unsafe if the president comes out and says that you know there are flying saucers. So. Um, I don't think I don't think the the people is, is ready for it yet. To be honest with you. But we've had UFOs over the White House. We've had UFOs uh, reported as far back as before World War II, even World War I. And yeah, there's small pockets right now. But this subject has gone into the mainstream in very interesting ways over the years. And I've kind of, you know, I kind of do my own little mini polling thing from time to time because I'll toss stuff at people just to kind of test them. I'm noticing more acceptance for this subject. I've actually had somebody who I've worked with for many years, who in the last year has come to me and she said, um, she's been watching History Channel or something, and she goes, um, I believe. She said, I absolutely believe this is true. And I didn't solicit that remark. Now, that's, that's very small scale. Yeah. But um, the fact of the matter is that on... on on the larger side of this, from from my viewpoint, they've been here a real long time, and they've hidden themselves among us. They've hidden themselves even in plain view, even in the skies. And I think it is our own belief structures as a race that have prevented us from understanding what's really going on. Chris, what? You, you, uh, and I wanted to add to that is it's also very interesting that. 
North America or the Western world is far more intolerant of this subject matter than other places in the world. Oh, yeah. There are places where it's kind of accepted. Oh, yeah, they are up there, you know. In China, people are, are able to report it to a government department, and the government does go out and, and look into it without you know, ridiculing or, or, or laughing or giving the people a hard time. They are, you know, they promote them to come to them and, and, and tell them what they're seeing. In Mexico, I think everybody in Mexico has seen the UFO and openly talks about it at this point. It's, yeah. it's like that in different parts of the world, it's accepted. It's us. We seem to almost have been brainwashed over a very long period of time to stay away this away from this subject it's like if you want to be a cool kid never ever you know go near this because the other kids are going to shun you and um we kind of took that and and made it this terrible monster where anything we don't fully understand we ridicule and reject and laugh at instead of saying gee i kind of feel stupid that these things are obviously all around here it's time we figure it out that never occurs to like uh, the, the mass of society. They go along with this brainwashing, and I had a couple of in- incidents that absolutely floored me in my life. And one was I was with a group of people at a party overlooking the Atlantic Ocean once on this big high deck off of this huge house, and we're like looking out over the Atlantic Ocean, and there came a huge craft. And it flew out over the ocean and just stopped and was hovering. And a physicist friend of mine was standing there and came over and got me and said, look, what is that? And I immediately started, oh, oh, oh. And we tried to call the other people over to look. They would come over and take a look for a second and say, oh, that's, you know, a seagull or make ridiculous comments and walk away. We couldn't even get them to like look at it. Finally, out of I'd say there maybe 20 people that were there, three or four of us realized we were seeing something very unusual. The rest did not want to be bothered. That was one event that I found extremely odd. I had other events happen to me where I know that there were like three or four people that had the same sighting. And as you were saying before, you know, you see the, a, a car crash. Everybody's going to have a different story. Well, not only did like two of the people have the same report of what they saw and what they looked at, the other two were going out of their way to deny what they saw. They would say things so ridiculous like it was a reflection of a train that got you know illuminated against a, a cloud and there was all you know an image of the train in the sky and that's anything but say that looked like something i've never seen before they wouldn't even give us that that much but the worst thing that happened to me in my life is I had not only a sighting I had was taken when I was a teenager with two of my friends and a whole bunch of other kids were around that also were taken. And we were taken and brought back, and it was a terrible experience. I don't remember what happened, but when the craft came, I have full, can tell you in detail what it looked like. And the other close friend that I was with agrees everything that happened to me happened to her but the third girl and she was a very religious girl acted so oddly after it happened we tried to and our families tried to go to her family to discuss this because it was a terrible event in our lives and the air force came and gave us all a terrible time gave our families a very bad time but this one girl that had the same exact experience with me got violent when I tried to talk with her and our our other friend tried to talk with her even alone you know why are you doing this she would go into a rage and start punching me and you know she had me on the ground and she was beating me and hitting me and crying and screaming get away from me get away from me and that was it our friendship was over and I had never you know saw her again really for a very long time after that but I never understood how the two of us, maybe it's just personal strength or something of character, but the two of us handled it one way, and this one girl couldn't even accept it. And I think that 
accepting that this actually was real and happened to her, she was not able to do that. And if that is not part of what's going on in our society, not only have they been brainwashed to deny it, they really can't handle it. It's just like an extra layer of um, understanding that they're they're not ready for now. It's just maybe too much or or whatever. But there's something something's wrong. There's something out of whack with all of this, and and that is as strange to me. And I always say this as the actual events. Well, I that's incredible. Yeah, go, I'm sorry, go, ahead. go ahead, Ken. Uh, yeah, that's basically why I feel that um, there's a, a millions and millions of people out there who uh, will not be able to deal with, with uh, disclosure. I think there's going to be people jumping out of windows, and, and uh, who knows? You don't even get me started on religion. That's another story. But uh, I don't know. I, I just don't think we're, we're ready yet. And I, and I know the government doesn't want to look like fools because they apparently can't do anything about these UFOs flying over our uh, nuclear sites and, and, and everything else. So it's, uh, I don't know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm up in the air about whether disclosure would be really good or not. Well, I look at it this way. We weren't really ready on September 11th, 2001 to watch those buildings come down in, in uh, Manhattan either. Yeah. We weren't really ready to watch... Uh, the Gulf War live on TV. I wasn't really ready when I was a little kid to watch the the nightly news and see the body count in Vietnam. Yes, the, that was terrible. The, the, the truth yeah. of the matter is that uh, cultural shock is sometimes the only way that messages get delivered. And I'm not a fan of the idea that government disclosure is the way anything's going to happen because... You know, whatever these beings are, whether they're malevolent, benevolent, they're smart. And I suspect they're smart enough to know that our government isn't really our government anyway. And the real leaders of this planet are not people they want to trust. And I suspect that disclosure, as I've said many times, is a process. And it's people like the people who listen to the show, the people who come on the show, whatever their level of understanding is that are pushing this thing out from the seams. And basically, disclosure is one person at a time, one consciousness at a time, and <clears throat> the mass public conscience will tip when there's an event that forces it, but it will never be formally announced. That's kind of the way I see disclosure at all. Okay, yeah, well, you're, you, you, you're probably right, I'm, I'm sure. Um, and, and I believe that it's starting very, very slowly. And Mr. Bigelow is, I think, in a great deal, the one who is going to slowly, slowly bring the, the universe and the other beings in it to us. He is starting to tell us but in very devious ways, like, you know, 1 o'clock in the morning on Easter Sunday, um, that this is going on and what he's going to do. And if just little pieces of society start to listen to him and know it, and then we're doing this show and all three of us have experience, we're not just talking, you know, off the top of our heads or in the third person, you know, talking to somebody else. It, it is things that happen to us. We are experiencers. So we kind of know what we're talking about. We are telling people, it's out there. It happened to me. Ken saw them. Randy's seen them. They're there. Yeah. And slowly this is by way of us. And, you know, the little pieces that they're allowing to be fed, being disclosed. But that's the way they're going to do it. And and everyone, I think, understands. I know there's groups out that go after the, you know, the military and the government to disclose, to disclose. And I, I, it strikes me very funny. What do you think any military on the face of this earth could do against a UFO, even two or three of them? You know what I mean? Nothing. You know who's in control of this? The people or the creatures or the beings that are in the UFOs, they're the ones that are controlling this, not us. Because I am sure they could um, paralyze and control us in, in, in a, a moment's time if they wanted to. And there's absolutely no technology we have that could go up against them. So it, it, it's, it's, uh, we are being handled. And I just wish we kind of accepted and knew that. 
they're well, there. I, I, They've I always been there. Probably, you know, and and we are just being watched. Ken, you have yeah, anything I, you want I, to I, add to that, please? I totally agree, um, uh, Chris. I my theory is this: this Earth has been here for billions of years. Yeah. And we have had thousands upon thousands of civilizations like our own here. Right. Even more advanced civilizations that have come and gone. Absolutely. You know, yeah, and when this civilization goes, you know, however that, that may be, uh, in a thousand years from now or a hundred thousand years from now, um, there won't be any trace that we were ever here. So, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I think the archaeologists are still digging up uh, things uh, that are astounding uh, that, that they're finding right yeah, now. they've got more pharaohs than they have time to stuff pharaohs into a timeline of. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, and we can't ever get anything right, too. That's what I love. As soon as we think we've got it nailed down, this is what happened. Well, a couple of months later, oh, we were wrong. <laughs> my take on it is, for one thing, we don't know as much as we think we do, and that we live in a far more elastic reality than I think we've been allowed to understand and I you know some of that's changing now and <clears throat> you can call it what you want you can call it the shift you can call it this post 2012 energetic thing I don't know but the conversation that I hear even among uh, I would say very conservative business people is changing and it's very subtle but there is there's there's a slight change there's a bit more acceptance and like I said to look for formal disclosure to me seems like we're expecting the reverse of take me to your leader whereas I think humanity is beginning to stir and you know you mentioned uh, religion and I will go there for a minute because religion is just another institution like government like intelligence agencies and even the military uh, that has been used to control the flow of information to humanity for a long time. And we've not been served by it. We know they rewrote the books. We know that a lot of what <laughs> we grew up believing were distortions of things that now, you know, maybe we'll understand someday. But I think, you know, looking at it from the standpoint of all the conversations I've had and I, I think the three of us can agree is that if we just step back for a minute and go how far have I gone in this journey and then begin to grant the grace for other people to make that, that walk as well I, I think that's really how it's going to occur that's true, that's right Yeah. so Ken when you do talk to people and you talk to somebody who has a sighting and we're going to talk about some of these sightings um, what is the sense you get of their emotional state, of what they're reporting? Do you get witnesses that are freaked out? Do you get witnesses who are uh, uh, sort of detached from what they've observed? Uh, is it all over the, the spectrum? It seems to be all over the spectrum. As a matter of fact, I, uh, my, the, one, the one case I, I did investigate... Um, I think I put a picture. I think I sent a picture of it, of, of it to you. It's, uh, I believe it's picture six, Alloway Township, New Jersey, nine twenty four oh seven. This was a, a gentleman who called in a, a, a UFO report, and, and uh, he was from Bridgeton, New Jersey. Now this is Alloway Township. Now Southern Jersey, you have to understand, is is a, a lot of horse farms, cow farms, it's very rural. Yep. And the reason why the reason why he moved out there was because he was a um, amateur astronomer and he had a little observatory in his backyard and he has just some incredible photos of of the moon and the, the planets and, and that's what he did as a hobby and he had some very expensive equipment. Well on this this photo here, um, I just brought it up on your website. It would be photo number six. I, I don't, uh, I'm sure some of the people from can see this. Uh, it was the night of September 24th, uh, 2007. I'm going to read the, the witness statement real quick. I like to be exact and read the witness statement if uh, I don't want to miss anything. Uh, the night of September 24th, 2007 was brightly lit due to a full moon. It was approximately 12, 11.30 at night, and I was outside with a digital camera nearby. I had nothing special in mind, but due to the bizarre experience I had last October 2006, 
I always keep a camera on hand when I'm out at night because this time I want to be ready if something flies over. Now, just as an added note, uh, a year before that, he had a, an incredible sighting of a black triangle, very huge object that, that went over top of, about 200 feet over top of him. He was in his, in his observatory at the time. It was around midnight, and, and this thing very slowly flew right over at his house and his observatory, and, and then uh, he he got a lot of details from it. As a matter of fact, he said it, it seemed that a very large black box was hanging from the bottom of this uh, triangle, and he could also see in the, in the the by the window of the triangle, he said it looked like some kind of a humanoid was walking back and forth. Uh, he was able to see this with so much clarity. He said he could see the ailerons and the rivets and everything else that was that was on this this triangle, but it was just enormous the size of a football field and then when it finally left it, it had the, the sound of, of uh, like bacon in a frying pan and as a matter of fact some of his electronic equipment in his observatory was fried after yeah. the sighting <laughs> yeah so, so this is the second sighting this is the, the picture that he was actually, uh, actually able to capture this time and it's, he says here, a bright light again caught my eye, and I observed this rectangular-shaped light begin to rise slowly behind a tree line in the south approximately one mile away. The object appeared to hover for about 20 seconds and then began to travel west at a very slow speed. As it began moving west, it seemed to pivot on both the vertical and horizontal axis, revealing more detail until it disappeared behind a tree. Now. The picture I have uh, I have up there that that's the one that shows where this is starting to pivot on on the the uh, vertical and horizontal axis. Where personally I think it's probably one of the clearest nighttime photos of a UFO I've ever seen. And he says that I captured this this object with my digital uh, camera and the pictures came out surprisingly well. I use a Canon 20 A I'm sorry 20 D A which I use for astrophotography. And he was, now with his first sighting, when he had his first sighting, he was just scared to death. He, he wouldn't go out to his observatory at night for months. Uh, I had to go down there and talk to him, calm him down, you know, uh, you know, explain to him that, you know, a lot of people see this, uh, I feel it's not going to harm you. And he eventually um, got the nerve to go back out to his observatory and, and start doing his thing. And as a matter of fact, he became a MUFON investigator, and then he did investigate a few cases in New Jersey, but then he moved out of state again. So this was a, a professional man, who retired, him and his wife. Uh, and another strange thing was when we investigated this, I no cooperation from the neighbors. I mean, they were they were so rude. They they just turned around. They they turned around and walked away from us. Uh, and even him, he was. They were new to the community. He was there about six months, I guess, and got to know some of the neighbors. And neighbors didn't want to have anything to do with them. So that, I just felt that as being very strange. Uh, the, the whole thing was strange. It really was. But uh, yeah, that that picture. Uh, uh, do you see that picture number six? What I'm talking about? Which one? What is the label on that again? Um, it, well, it says up number six on the upper left hand side of the picture. It says nine twenty four oh seven Alloway Township, New Jersey. And then a MUFON case number is eight one one one. Yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the image that I'm that I'm I'm talking about right now. Okay, got it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and again, you know, we've another aspect of what we're we're dealing with in the present time is more people have cameras. Um, cameras are cheaper and cameras are better. Um, you can take high definition photos with an Android or an iPhone now. And most people are walking around with phones in their pockets. And many people have, over the years, carried cameras around. I've carried camera with me for years. I mean, I used to carry these little um, Instamatic camera. I also had a full 35 millimeter uh, film, film rig. And I have digital SLR camera as well, plus video oh, yeah. camera. And, and you know, I know I'm kind of exceptional in that regard, but most people now are walking around with some kind of camera in their pocket. And I think 
as we go down the line, more and more people will begin to capture these if they can see them and if they can move quick enough. That's another thing. Um, there's been a few times when I wished I had a camera, and there's been a few times when I have not moved quick enough to be able to get something on film or on a card that I wished I could have when I saw it. Oh, yeah. oh please. I just, you, you're just hitting a real nerve with me. <laughs> one, of the be- one of the best... I always walk around with cameras also, always. I've been ready for years and years. <laughs> The, one of the biggest sightings I ever saw, you know where my my camera was? It was during, right after Hurricane Sandy, or Super Storm, Storm Stand Sandy. Yeah. Everything was plugged into my car in the parking lot, getting recharged, while I was about, oh, 150 feet away. And, and I had these huge orbs fly right over our heads, my whole family. And all of our... All our gadgets were being recharged in the car. So talk about, you know, timing. The one time I didn't have it with me, they almost like landed on my head. So (laughs) that's very frustrating. (laughs) Being ready at the right time, even if you have the equipment, it's still, you just have to be calm, ready, and lucky that you've got all those things in one place at one time and have the experience. But people are going to be ready they are going to see them and in the future you're going to it's going to be impossible to deny this at so, at some point if yeah, that happened to me a few years ago I, I took my grandchild and my wife we went down to the Cape May's um Cape May Courthouse Zoo they have a real nice zoo down there yes so, yes yeah we took our camera my well my wife took her she has a a, a digital SLR and uh we went down, and, and she, of course, she took a ton of pictures of the uh, of the animals and my grandchild. And we had a you know fun day, and we finally uh, we were going to eat our lunch out at the picnic table there before we left. And and I happened to look up at a it looked like a, a uh, uh, it was a commercial airliner. I would say it was approximately uh, maybe about three thousand feet up, and right next to this airliner, towards the rear of the plane, was a a a very shiny silver cylinder. At first I thought it was a military transport plane and, and it may have had a chase plane next to it. You know, I was expecting to, to, to see a military plane, a small one, but no, it, it was a, the, the, the light flashed off at a few times and it was definitely a, a um, very shiny uh, uh, cigar shaped of, of a UFO. And by the time I, I grabbed my wife's camera you know, figured out how to turn it on and, and figured out, you know, I'm going to put it on Infinity to take the picture. I mean, this this thing was, it was practically gone by that time. So what I did was, um, I like the digital SLRs, the ones that have the viewfinders. I, I really, yeah. I really can't see, you really can't see any detail in, in some of these screens that they have on these cameras these days. I mean, a lot of times you're, you're just pointing this camera and, and taking a photo with it and, and hoping that that the picture comes out because especially in, in daylight you can't see a thing with these these cameras that have the small screens on them so that's why I like to look right to the viewfinder I, I, I feel I get a better shot that way but but I did take some pictures I, I pointed the camera up in the air and just started clicking away and, and uh, the funny part was I did get a photo of a UFO closer to a plane that was much higher than the one that I was taking a picture of. Huh. Yeah, so that was that was really kind of weird. And I, I also wanted to uh, uh, mention, a lot of people do not realize, but today's digital cameras and, and iPhones, um, they have, it's called EXIF. That right. means exchangeable image file. And, and basically what that means is today's digital cameras and, and iPhones, it, it, they attach information to your photo, including G- GPS coordinates. Exactly, yeah. Because some of well, it depends on 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 what brand and, and make you have. But some of them attach a little bit of info, and some of them, I believe, the the new Apple iPhone, uh, either 4S or S4, it even attaches the GPS longitude latitude as to where you were when you took the photo. Yeah, that's, that, that's incredible. I know that the Android phones, if you have GPS enabled on the higher end Android phones, they will and they will also insert that information into the EXIF uh, metadata. Yeah. So uh, I think I think I, well, what we do is we sometimes I, I use this information a lot uh, to uh, try to find hoaxes. Um, you know, someone trying to hoax a, a picture, but you have to be careful sometimes because. 
just because the information on the EXIF information may say uh, Windows uh, Photo Gallery or Adobe Photoshop doesn't necessarily mean that that you know someone did a paste and, and crop job on on the photo because yeah. I, I use this all the time with my photos. I'm always enhancing photos, and sometimes you have to brighten them and darken them. And when you do that, then the pro the program on your computer because I have Microsoft Windows Photo Gallery. It assigns an ID number to the image, and it also puts the date that I made uh, any adjustments to the photo. And, and like I said, the only adjustments I make is just maybe exposure and, and light and darken. But uh, sometimes with this information, we can uh, catch someone who's uh, you know trying to hoax a photo. One of the things that I've told people who are going to try and document anything like this is since we're now in the digital era, nobody's using film anymore. Um, is that um, they not alter the original files, but dump those files and then use backup files to do enhancements on? Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I think yeah. Well, yeah, it's easier sometimes easier said than done to get everyone. No, to I understand. I understand that too, because we have another problem, and that is that. And I was just having a conversation with somebody who was telling me about some extraordinary film that exists. And I can't talk about it right now, but I can tell you that this film is mind-blowing if, if it exists. And we were discussing the fact that basically in the digital era, we now have a, a, a problem because in a way... It's become. It has become easier to hoax. It's also become more difficult to authenticate because back in the old days, you could authentic authenticate film by dye lots and emulsions and the grains that were used in different film, and <clears throat> even you know the better cameras did uh, date time stamp things on the film itself. So we have problems with that now, but at the same time we have the ability now. For everybody to have a camera and theoretically increase the odds that we're going to get more and better images, are we seeing more and better images? I mean, you're the guy that's got you know thousands of uh, pictures on your website now. What is your sense of the the quality of data that we're getting now? Uh, yeah, no, I think they're they're much better. Uh, you know, with the, with the millions of megapixels now, you know, you get a camera these days with with 14 megapixels. It's a Basically, that means it's uh, you're going to get a clearer image, and you can take that image and, and enlarge it. You can crop it. Uh, you know, you could do a few things to it, and, and you'll still get a crystal crystal clear photo of what you were trying to take a picture of. And uh, it, it, it's even it's, it's going to get better, as a matter of fact, I think. And, and uh, I've been able to uh, sometimes if I if I get a real good photo, I usually get my photos from uh, a new phone, of course, and and. Uh, I read the uh, the case file and and you know make sure it's a it's a legitimate photo and and uh, but with some of these photos that that they're getting uh, they they're many megapixels and and I, I think it's uh, I think they're really coming. Sometimes I would I would I take one and crop it and, and blow it up and and I like some I can get two pictures out of one sometimes for my website and it's it uh, you know it makes the object look even even better because I can get a real close shot of it. Uh, so yeah, I th I'm excited about it. I think it's going to get better. Can, can I add something in here, though? Go for it, if you don't mind. No, uh, I, I also, you're the host. <laughs> my opinion of this is that um, I hope that people, Randy, do kind of what you suggested, though. When you take a picture or you video get something on video, don't use the original to start cropping and, and changing or, or, or working on your image. Keep your original as it is and then use a copy to do the rest of it. And with this, is I, I say this for a reason, because it may be very important to, uh, at one point, have the original document exactly yeah. as it was. Now, yeah. this also I asked them to do when they repeat or report a sighting. And I started to have problems with this years and years ago when I started to interview all these people. I, I, I had a sixth sense because I've been through it so many times in, in life and with people that have been through it. I knew when someone was just telling me a story or making it up or if they had an incident. 
there's just something about them. It's almost a, a, a fear in it's them intuition. that you can right, yeah. and you can sense that they're telling you the truth. And but although they were telling me the truth, I felt because of the internet and society and Hollywood and all these influences, they felt it necessary to fluff up the story. So instead of just saying to me, I was standing in my driveway and this huge craft silence, you know, silently flew the length of my driveway down my street and, you know, then shot up in the air and it scared me to death. They start to add layers of things to make it brighter or more interesting or to captivate their audience to listen to them because actually many experiences are only seconds or minutes long they're brief although they will in you know be part of their life that they'll never forget for the rest of their life they're brief and instead of just sticking to the black and white of what exactly happened they start to fluff it up and i wish they wouldn't do that because we're losing enormous information that we really need to have when you start to color everything and you know to get to the bottom of this we really need to know exactly what they're experiencing and what they saw and i see this happening a lot in abductions too yeah. because abductions that i deal with i call them the real time abductions meaning they happen during the day when you're going about your business and bang you're you know dealing with something you don't want to you don't remember all or most of it and you return you're sick as a dog and and that was it you know and you vomit for the next 2 weeks that's not as interesting as being able to make up a big scenario of, you know, remembering this and having to shoved up here and shoved up there. That doesn't help people. That doesn't help us yeah. understand what's going on. So, you know, if you can stick to the truth and stay with it, eventually we're going to figure it out. But, you know, don't add things that it's like giving somebody a, a map to, you know, the gold field and then putting all forks in the road so they never get there. We, we want to get to the gold field, so just directly send us to it, you know. So um, I, I just wanted to add that in. So if you have, you know, a, a photo or a video, keep what you actually did that day and saw separate from enhancing it to maybe have it put on the Internet. That, that, that's all I, re, 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 you know, request. And when you tell what you saw or what happened to you, just stick to the story. Just tell that's us what happened. Story. I totally agree with you, Chris. I think we're up on uh, about the uh, one hour mark. Maybe take a break at this point. Everybody can stretch their legs and we'll come back. I want to go through a few more of the photos that are up on the website and talk a little bit more uh, about some of the issues involved with ufology. Talk a little bit about um, uh, some, some of your cold case files that you've gone through, Ken. Well, let's probably also want to talk a little bit about orbs and alien drones and some of the more wild stuff. So, and I uh, have a couple of questions for Ken too. I know you do, and we're gonna we're gonna gonna ask him about. We're gonna open that up on the other side. So, take a break and come back uh, in about um, well seven or eight minutes, like we usually do. I have uh, queued up Genesis Watcher of the Skies for the break or the song break and uh, we'll be back in a few minutes with Off Planet Radio Live.
something you're listening to off Planet Radio. And we welcome you back to the second hour of Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Moggins with Chris Holly, and Ken Pfeiffer is here as our guest tonight. Um, yeah, we're we're covering aspects of the whole UFO thing that really need to be talked about. The hard evidence. Um, there's a lot of woo woo out there. But at the end of the day, um, we do need to provide evidence and proof, and our guest has done just that. Thousands of photographs on his website that indicate that there is indeed something going on in the sky. And Chris and Ken, welcome back. Hello, Hello everybody. Let me just uh, do a little bit of housekeeping work here. After immediately following this second hour tonight, there will be a post-show segment with Duncan O'Finian and Miranda Kelly. I also need to do something I really suck at, and that's say thank you to people that support <laughs> us. Um, there is a PayPal button. Some of you have accessed the PayPal button, and I need to say thank you. Um, that really helps the cost of streaming servers, things like that. We're not coast to coast. Um, uh, Mr. Bigelow has not written us a check, uh, <laughs> at least not yet. So uh, we sort of rely on nickels and dimes and dollars that you guys help us out with, and I need to say thank you. And with that, uh, Chris is going to lead off this hour, and she's gonna she's got some things she wants to bring up, talk about, and uh, I welcome you both back. Okay, and uh, Mr. Bigelow, there's three of us right here yeah, that really. Would really do you justice. I want my, you're listening. I want my money check. <laughs> Ken, I have waited all day long to ask you about two things to see if you have had other reports like it or or any information about it. The one thing is probably the biggest UFO sighting report that was ever told to me that I was given by a friend that has been my friend since I've been like six years old and to this day is still my friend who is a skeptic who really wants nothing to do with anything paranormal. He got me aside finally. I could tell something was bothering him. And he works for a utility company at the time he did years ago. Well, mm, it was only 10 years ago. And he was a supervisor and out on a call on Long Island because there was a blackout in the section of Long Island. And when he got there, he knew that the problem seemed to be out in the middle of the woods where they had a huge high wire, high voltage area where they have all those towers with the high wires on it. And also out there was a radio transmitting tower and a cell phone tower out in this place on the end of Long Island, not too far from Plum Island or where the heart machine is supposed to be located and other terrible areas of Long Island. But anyway, that's where this was located. And he told me during this blackout, he they, they go in groups of, of like three or four men because they never go into a wooded area or a dangerous area alone. It's company policy. They took and they hiked at like 2 o'clock in the morning out because there was, uh, as I said, a blackout in the area, to this area where these high voltage uh, uh, towers were located. And he said as they approached them, they looked up and he said above the whole area, this like little valley where all these things were located, was this massive, massive black UFO just hovering with rays laser-like beams down into the wires and it was just hovering there with these rays these laser rays into the wires and he said it frightened him to death and they backed away and slowly retreated until they could run back to their trucks when they got back to their trucks all of a sudden there was like a surge and the area's lights all went back on and he and the other fellows discussed it and didn't report it because they were worried about their jobs. And the one fellow sort of fell to pieces and started to cry and carry on and, and lost it. 
uh, you know, emotionally lost it. And they had to deal with him for a while. And he begged them never to, to talk about it again. And when he died, my friend waited a few years and then told me the story and said, you can write about it, but just never say who I am. Because he is now also retired from, from this, um, you know, utility company. Have you ever heard of another report that they were actually connected down into a wire grid like that? Well, as a matter of fact, we, we had a couple sightings um, in Woodstown, and uh, we had one Woodstown sighting a few years ago where this uh, black triangle was basically hovering over top of the, the high power line. Now, this the sighting that I was just speaking about a little while ago from Bridgeton, uh, Alloway Township, uh, his house is located approximately about a half mile from the high tension wires that go to the Salem nuclear plant, which is, which is approximately 13 miles away. So I, quite frankly, I, I really think that uh, some of these uh, objects are, are uh, possibly getting, uh, getting power from, from our high tension wires and our nuclear plants. Now, that was another thing. I went to then the smartest people I knew, people from, you know, I, I knew when I was in school and things like that. And I went to uh, two physicists, a scientist, and an international businessman because they just were the smartest people I knew. And I told them all the story and asked, what do you think they were doing? Because I titled my article, A Feeding UFO, because that's exactly what I thought, that it was pulling the energy from it. And they all said separately without knowing what the others told me that no they didn't feel that 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 would be an antique form of energy for them that they don't believe that they use that at all as energy they felt they were either downloading or both downloading and uploading things into the grid that they wanted to put into our society so they were either gathering what we talk about watch say is on the radio whatever and also downloading things that could be being fed to us and we would never know it. You know, um, subliminal, is that the way you say it? I'm trying yeah, to find that yeah, word. Uh, information that he, they said, frankly, would go into every house that had anything to do with that grid. So that terrified me when they, the three of them came up with the same answer. And I thought to myself, oh, good Lord, I wonder how much this is really happening. And because these areas might be located in wooded or uh, isolated areas like this one is, it's not seen too much. But they said, he said, that the craft was at least the size of maybe a football field and a half. It was so huge. Was it a triangle? And, no, it was, ra it was oval. Oh, okay. And um, this, you know, as I said, was not that long ago. It was about 10 years ago. So that, that to me was very interesting that they may be, you know, feeding us a lot of, you know, I call it dumb dumb medicine or whatever they're doing that, that maybe helps keep us brainwashed, that they can just come and go and do whatever they want. Or they're just gathering everything we talk about, look at, see, and maybe adding some things in for us. Uh-oh. Boy, it looks like that whole line dropped off there. Oh, wow. What a coincidence. Isn't that interesting? Okay, let me go to music here for a few minutes, and I will try and get the phone lines back up and running, because it looks like everything just completely dropped on that note. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Okay, we're back. <laughs> you know... Ken, I'm not even going to go there again because obviously that was not a popular subject, I guess, because we all kind of oh, could, you know, the hell was popular. <laughs> uh, uh, I I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that Long Island is a strange place. Uh, I know they, they do have a heart there, and of course, Plum Island, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, I don't know if you're exactly. aware of it, but I was talking about New London, Connecticut <clears> earlier, and as a matter of fact, they have a ferry that goes from. Uh, New London to uh, Long Island, and it's basically not, 
New London is not really that is not really that far from Long Island itself. Now, when you, you were telling that story, I was thinking I can see Connecticut from my house. It's yeah. right, you know. It's only I think at the widest point, thirteen miles away from me. So it's there. They're my neighbor. You know, they're right there. We can see. I look at them every day. But uh, they also, uh, I wouldn't say benefited from, but I think they suffered from being near. Camp Hero and the Air Force Base that was in the 50s and 60s. I, I don't remember exactly when it closed. Uh, and and um, uh, Brookhaven Lab is out there. And now oh, yeah. this heart machine, it's all in the same area. And we constantly had terrible things going on on Long Island. And, of course, we all knew it was from that area. Plum Island. Um, was just known to be an area that the locals, us that lived here on Long Island, the big dummies that we all were and still are, um, are we having another call come in? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're fine, we're fine. I'm just... Okay, all right. Okay, um, we're okay. good. Okay, uh, that those people accepted all this because it was constant, you know, strange animals were found on the shores. W look at... Uh, also, that was less than ten years ago. Maybe it was maybe four, five years ago. Yeah. Just recently, we found that man laying on the shore of Plum Island who had eighteen-inch fingers and a big hole drilled in his head, and he was dead, and he was dressed strangely, and they just tried to kind of blow it off. It was in the newspapers. You go out there, you question the local police. They said, yeah, he had the 18-inch fingers and was a real weird dude. What happened to him? Well, we don't know. We think the military took his body. And at this point, Long Islanders just go, oh, okay, let me stay away from that. But UFOs were common when I was a kid. Everybody saw them all the time. Oh, and yeah. don't forget, poor little Long Island not only had all these terrible things built on it, these terrible areas of human monstrous activity, plus probably aliens out there with them, we stick out in the Atlantic Ocean. So coming in and getting out of Long Island is, is and was, even then it was less populated, very easy. So it's a perfect place to, you know, really... Screw with the locals, you know, take the poor little guy and use him for what he wants and throw him back. What are they going to do about it? And that's oh, yeah. what happened. And Connecticut is right there, right part of it, in, in the same, you know, boat. But, um, Ken, the other thing I want to ask you about, the strangest thing, years ago I started to get these reports from all over the world. And first I got three of them and I thought that somebody was playing a joke on me. But I wrote about it anyway. And it was about floating buildings that they were seeing. They were claiming that they would see a building float by their town or on a highway yes. or something. Yes. Float by them and just disappear. And it, it, it blew their minds. Or they would be driving along and they'd be like a five-story building floating along the desert landscape there where they were driving from town to town not touching the ground but right there so i wrote about it and unbelievably i got report after report of people saying we never thought anybody else would believe us but we also saw a building float by have you ever had a report about something like that and if so do you think it's a military thing uh, no, quite frankly, I know I haven't, myself, I haven't gotten any reports out of New Jersey about that, but uh, that's why I love the Internet. If you were to go and Google, as a matter of fact, that's what I've just done. I Googled uh, floating buildings UFO on, on the computer, and uh, a ton of things come up. It says here a uh, UFO, a building like UFO was seen over Israel in December 2012, and they have a video. So uh, I'm just basically saying for all, all you all you listeners out there, if you want to be a researcher, um, Google has made it very easy. You can research anything you want to research. Just Google it, and, and uh, a ton of information will come up for you. But personally, no, I haven't had any experience with the with the floating uh, the buildings at, at all. How right. about you, Randy? Have I've you heard of them? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, this is a weird subject because uh, I actually have had this conversation with some friends of mine, and we've agreed that and sometimes uh, things feel like dream state that's what this feels like to me but yeah i have to say that that's something i've i've thought i observed 
and I've wondered about it, and other people have mentioned it, and it is a very weird phenomena because it's a complete disconnect, even for somebody who is an observer and an experiencer. I mean, we're looking for ships, we're looking for beings, and all of a sudden you've got buildings or skylines or edifices that are appearing yeah. on the horizon, and, and it's very fast, and you... This is this is where I actually do kind of understand how people do the disconnect, because I think there's a place where everybody kind of breaks down. So the answer is, yes, I believe I've seen that, and yes, I know other people that have experienced that and have mentioned it to me, and we've talked about it. My, my theory on this goes way beyond the UFO thing, because I'm wondering, are we experiencing dimensional rifts? which is, you know, a completely out there subject, but everybody on this call, most of the people that are listening on, you know, chatting tonight, have, to some degree or another, we agree that there are beings out there, there are civilizations out there, and that we live in a world that's not quite exactly what we think it is. So, I'm comfortable with the idea that what I saw may not have been as three-dimensional as I would have liked it to have been. Or could it be a hologram that who That's knows another is, possibility. is showing to us? Yeah. It could it be a hologram where they're trying to show us, make us believe something is there that isn't. And a third opinion that was emailed to me is what if the um, military somehow, by way of a place like a Plum Island, who may deal with other beings from dimensions or, or, or aliens or whatever, are working with them, learn to levitate buildings and you're seeing it being done as an experiment or they were actually moving something and you just happened to witness it. There's all kinds of theories out there, but I find it that that's amazing that anyone would, would see that. I, I, an army town in Utah, I think it was or some kind of base, was around the one sighting where a few people in the town saw it claim an entire building was levitating across their small little town into the mountains where this base was located and they all watched it happen and you know what can I say to these people is my god you know I wonder what's going on there but um, the, all these things are all UFOs because we don't know what it was that just flew by it's an object and, yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. Now, um, Ken, how do you think all this might tie into the heart machines that are all over the world? Well, uh, I personally, I think the heart machines are doing some, they're doing some weather experiments, and I didn't realize it, but of course, heart machine stands for High Frequency Auroral Research Program. Uh, I think it was started around 1990, and, and uh, I, I researched this today, and coming to find out that uh, there's a, of course we all know there's a harp in Alaska, there's a harp in Area 51, Long Island, New York, Puerto Rico, Peru, United Kingdom, Russia. Norway, Russia, India, Australia, Japan, and China. Yeah. Apparently they all have these harp facilities uh, in, in their countries. And of course, you know, the, it's supposed to analyze the ionosphere to enhance technology for radio communication. Oh, yeah, I, I believe that one, sure. Yeah, well, good, because nobody else does. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, it's kind of like a, it, it's kind of like an outdoor microwave, I think, is, is what some people have, uh, tried to describe this as. And what it's actually supposed to do, it's supposed to excite a limited area of the ionosphere. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's being used for uh, poss possible other things. I, I, I really don't know, to be honest with you. I, I, I think it's, it's affecting, would have to affect the weather somehow. And, and uh, of course, there you have your theories out there that these things are creating the hurricanes and tornadoes and everything else. But, uh, frankly, I really don't know. Well, Dr. Nick Begich did a book uh, along with um, my guest from last week called Angels Don't Play This Harp and he discussed the effects of the uh, uh, high, or, high altitude aurora project 
as being a, a military operation that was clearly tied into several things. It wasn't just one thing, but it was altering the ionosphere, and it was a, a weather modification program as well. If you look at what they're doing, and let's go into this as well, with the chemtrailing, uh, it's very clear that they're doing a number of things as well. They're doing weather modification. It looks like they're doing biological terraforming, and they are, um, well, they're doing uh, solar dimming as well. If you look at the sky during the day when they're aer aerosoling, we're getting reduced overhead um, solar as well as a reduced ceiling on the uh, on the uh, upper atmosphere. So, I don't know. I just I'll toss that out and see what your thoughts are about it as well, Ken. I, like I said, I, I really don't know. I, I wish I was a scientist. I'm not... Uh, but as I'm a pilot, <laughs> as a pilot, do, what do you observe with the sky? What do you know now about uh, the, the the changes, for instance, in the cloud canopy on, on what you're seeing visually and even maybe instrument-wise in terms of the skies that you would navigate? Well, essentially... Uh there are layers in the sky, and you really can't see these layers from the ground. You know, some layers may look like overcast, but, but there are some layers that you really can't see them until you fly through them. And it's, uh, I, I wish I was, I was more knowledgeable about all that, but I, I really, I am not. I'm, I'm a, a fair weather flyer. I, I don't fly instruments. I've never, never felt the need to ever want to, uh, fly in a storm cloud for whatever reason, but, uh, now I'm not really sure about uh, about what's going on with this harp thing. I, I, it's, uh, I'm sure we'll all find out soon, though. I I don't know if we will or not. Also, there's I don't know if two of you have given any um, credence, but I've been told that when Te Tesla, I believe, developed all this technology, that he did it originally for a, a weapon which would be the pulverizing death ray that, you know, you hear a little bit about. And I'm wondering if that has something to do with them springing up all over the world. Because if one person has this technology, you know then everybody else has to have it just to make it a fair, you know, level ground. So what do you think about that? Yeah, that's an area that... I'm not knowledgeable enough about myself. Um, you know, one thing we know about these secret projects is that there are multiple agendas playing out and that they lie to the public about all yes, of it. absolutely. Um, nobody has ever come out. There's been no congressional hearings, at least not in public, over HARP, just like there is no congressional accountability over chemtrails. And Chris, you and I are going to do some shows on that as well. Yes. Um, so what we have is our eyes and our ability to observe from the ground and to be able to glean information about what what we know is going on. There have been changes in the atmosphere ongoing since 1998, which is about the time that I reckon they began doing the aerosol pro projects. And nobody's ever given me a satisfactory answer as to why. But I will say that, you know, I, here again, something changed. Things changed in the late 90s that we began seeing these black ops programs, both HARP and the aerosol programs, coming into play. And I, I can't help but think that, you know, there's something going on. Uh, it's clearly military, but I, I tend to think this is all multi-layered. I kind of think it's probably the worst thing that's ever happened to us in recent history, heart machines. And I wish I could go and dismantle every single one of them of, on this globe. I think that they're co going to cause us nothing but harm, and they're going to uh, they're going to be a real challenge for everyone on this earth. Because let's face it, if they are weather machines. He who controls the weather controls the world. Re know that and remember that. And if they are more, well, that's a kind of weaponry that we are not, as a civilization, uh, capable of dealing with right now. But it might be here. 
So, you know, I am anti-harp every step of the way, but I realize that they're here, and unfortunately for me, there's one, oh, maybe 30 miles from where I'm sitting right now, and um, I, I... I, I dread it. I, I hate it, and I think it's why I lived through a superstorm that was absolutely crazy. In fact, I think all of us were had to, some piece of that storm, didn't we? That didn't storm you? was extremely strange. We it had, was a terrible thing here. We have had incredible shifts in our weather. Um, I, I'm watching the clock tick down here, Ken. There's a couple of things I wanted. First off, do you have any follow-up questions or anything, Chris? Nope. Um, I just want Ken to tell us what he thinks we need to know. One of the things I wanted to go over, and this goes back to the uh, photo gallery that's up on the website, and I'm going to reference two of the images here. Um, Moon Strange Building near the Zeman U Crater. And you have an image here that's highlighted that you discovered in uh, September of 2012. You want to talk about this image a little bit? Oh uh, yeah, was that the is that the ISS photo of the UFO over Delaware? Uh no, this is Moon Strange Building near the Zeman U crater. Oh yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, what I've been doing is I've been uh, as a, I don't really don't think anyone is looking at these photos. Uh, what I've been doing is going to the it's the IAU, the International Astronomical Union. Right. Um, this is part of the um, uh, U.S. Geological Survey. And there is a website. The website is uh, planetarynames.wr.usgs.gov. That should bring you to the the website. And what they have done is is they have taken uh, they've chopped up the moon, both the far side and near side, into into manageable areas where you can look at these things and and this is one of the many things that i found on on this website and that's the one the uh zeman u crater i think that's the one you're talking about that, right that you, right, that, right. Uh, that's that's just something i i found looking at all the other photos you know there weren't any other things you know sometimes um uh the, the photograph may be uh blurry or it may be just distorted for some reason uh but I mean, this thing was right there, and uh, it looks like a Casio watch to me. <laughs> it's, it's very strange. Kind of does, but it doesn't conform to the rest of the surface. Oh, it no, has a symmetry a to it, and it doesn't. Uh, and I'm I'm pulling this out here because are you familiar with the Faisal and Mars work that was popularized by Richard Hoagland back in the nineties? Oh yeah, sure. Okay, mm -hmm. so that work, and then. Um, I've interviewed um, a gentleman by the name of uh, Andrew Boschago, who is an attorney out in Seattle. And Andrew was part of a government project during the 1970s when he was growing up. And it's a, a very strange and very long story. The long and short of it is that Andy has been pulling um, images from Mars rovers where he's pointed out details of creatures on Mars. Now, this is even you, Crater. Where is this on the moon? Is this near side or far side, what's called the dark side of the moon? Uh, it's, uh, I believe it's the dark side of the moon. Okay. We get repeated stories, and I know this is woo-woo, but we have to deal with it because... Um, Sometimes all we have is the preponderance of witnesses, and then somebody pulls up a piece of data like this photograph, and we have to look at it, and we have to begin to pull data points where we can get them. That there are, in fact, have been and are ongoing missions um, that place operations of whatever type, both on the lunar surface and on the surface of Mars as well. Is that something that you've speculated about as well, Ken? Uh, yeah. As a matter of fact, I, I think I have another photo, photo on there, another one of my discoveries. Um, yes, it's uh, Mars. Mars. Yeah. Yeah, NASA. NASA. yeah, that's the University of Arizona. Uh, yeah, that was another another one that I... And, and taking a look at that, maybe you can... Uh, that sure doesn't look like a natural... Um, 
like a, a natural object, a, a mountainside or something like that. I mean, it's just to me. No, it's, it's a like complete anomaly. Depending on where this is on the surface of Mars, um, I can't speculate on what it is. Yeah. But it doesn't conform to the terrain around it in any way that I can, I can well, think of. Well, it's funny because I remember the terrain. Of course, I have all the information about this photo and, and exactly where it is. I don't have it on me right now. But uh, that whole area, it, it reminded me of a, of a, a crash site of a plane. There, just, just, there seemed to be so many strange things. But this was the strangest one that I picked up. And I got this from the... Uh, uh, NASA JPL Jet Propulsion Laboratories at uh, the University of Arizona. They also have a website. Now it seems that NASA has 100, 200 websites, and it seems that the hard part is trying to find that website that's going to have the high def, um, you know, photos. I'm talking uh, at least four megapixel uh, uh, photos that you can zoom in on and, and you know be able to get a closer look of, of either the moon or Mars. And that seems to be the trick is finding them websites that offer them photos. Well, and you have to get them early. You have to harvest this stuff early. Because I've been told, and it's been actually pretty well demonstrated, that NASA has gone back and deprecated their own images in a number of cases. They've pooled yeah. images. And so people need to constantly be culling through these images, which is what a number of researchers are doing. Um we covered this story a couple of years ago about the fact that even the face on Mars was only a half story that was told by Mr. Hoagland that in fact other images existed in other parts of Mars other types of structures and I was actually sent images that were removed from the original presentation of the face on Mars information that was both videoed and uh published in the book oh, yeah. so, so this kind of research is important because all we can do is correlate data points that's that's all we have we don't have the ability to fly up there right now and investigate this this information ourselves so i thought it was interesting that you pulled this information out because it tells me that your gut instinct tells you there's something there well I, i'll tell you what I, I, there's thousands upon thousands of photos that that I think no one is looking at, and so I'm. I'm uh, I, I've just touched the tip of the iceberg in, in research and uh, going through a lot of these photos, and I'm and I'm hoping that uh, the originals stay there and that uh, NASA doesn't come in and, and change things around on me. I guess one of the areas I want to go to with you, Ken, is there's two points. The first is you've taken the trouble to put up two websites with an enormous amount of um, physical um, eyeball material. evidence, material. Mm -hmm. Why haven't MUFON and the other organizations that are hardcore researchers out there doing this? And I'm not taking pot shots at MUFON, but everybody knows that um, there's criticism well-deserved. You're doing this as a private individual. Why isn't there a concerted effort to pull this together in, in a database from a, from a global level? Well, basically, I, I had a long conversation this weekend with a few MUFON members, a few MUFON people that are on the, on the board of MUFON, and basically what it all boils down to is, is MUFON is a, it seems to be a, an organization that collects information. Uh, the, the problem with our investigators is, um, you know, we're all volunteers. And you do take a test, and you do have an open book test, and basically they're just making sure you're not a stone idiot mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to become an investigator. And a lot of these investigators get involved, and they start investigating cases, and then then they just they get tired of it, and they they give up, or they just you know they just come to their own conclusions that well you know this is swamp gas, so it, it can't be a UFO. And, and to make a very long story short, a lot of the investigations. <laughs> That are done by MUFON, they're done by amateurs. I mean, these, these, even though they're, they're, they have the classification of investigator, uh, that, that really doesn't mean that they know what they're doing. But, but MUFON, with the, the new, uh, the new man on board there, Dave McDonald, he's, uh, he's got some new, um, parameters that he wants the investigators to, to walk, you know, to, to go through to help investigate, uh, different cases. And, and, uh, you know, he seems to be, 
possibly trying to get MUFON back on the right track here. Because when I joined, uh, I, I joined when John Schusler was the uh, uh, director of MUFON, and then, mm-hmm. of course, James Carrion came and went. Uh, Clifford Cliff came and went, and now Dave McDonald is now the director of MUFON, and, and uh, he seems to, I'm hoping, uh, I'm hoping there's light at the end of the tunnel here where we may be able to get um, uh, better investigators and, and a better way of, of uh, overseeing the whole operation of MUFON. Like I said, we're all, we're all, we are all um, volunteers, and, and the reason why I do this is because you know it's it's a, it's a passion of mine, and and I have another website, uh, www.mufonnewjerseynews.com. I have about three or four hundred articles on that one also. So uh, it's just a passion. I, I think that's what it is. Uh, Mufon has to get people who are absolutely passionate about what they do, and and uh, this is going to be the kind of people that's going to. Uh, is going to help um, you find out and, and, and bring them back as to where they, um, you know, are supposed to be the largest in the world from what I understand, but the only problem is there's so many UFO organizations that's popping out that everyone is, a lot of people are reporting their sightings to different organizations, and, and now we don't have a central uh, locale as to where all these uh, sightings go to. They're, they're spread out all over the place right now, so... And and they need to hire people or get volunteers that have some experience in these subjects and understand and have worked with them. Um, they don't do that. They don't reach out to the people that are known to have experience and know what they're talking about or have dealt with these subjects firsthand. They ignore them. And that's a big, a big, big, big mistake by MUFON. They need to gather the people that know what they're talking about to to get this organization straightened out. And I wish they would do it. I totally agree. As a matter of fact, uh, there's been some talk about uh, MUFON has a gentleman who who analyzes their photos, and apparently this this gentleman is is very good in what he does. I mean, he's. he's uh, Apparently a, a professional photographer. But when I first started on my website, World UFO Photos, I, I put 800 photos on my website and I sent them to him, uh, you know, since he was their analyst from UFON and I was excited to, to see what he thought about these 800 photos that I, I sent to him. I wanted him to look at my website and give it a review and, and uh, he told me that every one of the photos on my site was explainable. Now, this is the gentleman who analyzes the photos from UFON, and, and I still can't wrap my head around that. I, I, can't, I can't get through my head why MUFON would be, have someone who would be more towards debunking a sighting than promoting the fact that these UFOs exist. And, uh, mm. Well, I, I would say that that once that ma- that gentleman said that the proof of burden was on him, and I'd say go at it. We'd love to hear your explanations. And we even give you airtime to do it. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I've, I've been round and round with this gentleman, and, and you know, it's it's uh, you're, you're at the bunker. You're beating it, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's I didn't want to come out and say it, but no, he he's did. he's not even a skeptic. He's a debunker. I, I feel he is. Another follow-up question that I have for you. You were at the Baltimore meeting this past weekend, which I was going to attend, but it sold out before I got my reservation. Um, You had um, John Alexander there who did a a talk, and I wish I could have been there. Given that this occurred the week after the citizens' hearings on um, UFOs, how is it that John Alexander continues to contend that the government has never hidden information, especially after Stephen Greer's press conference where he revealed all of these military figures who came out and said that they knew about the UFOs and they knew that the government was suppressing information. Um, I don't know if you were in on that talk or you can comment on it, but I'm curious. I would like to be... Uh, yeah, I was there. I, I saw, um, you know, um, 90% of all of the... Uh the speakers, and yeah, that was uh, that's a retired Colonel Dr. John Alexander, uh, U.S. Army. Uh, yeah, he did a two-hour, uh, two-hour and fifteen-minute uh, uh, speech of uh, myths, conspiracies, and realities. And, and uh, quite frankly, the information was excellent information. But uh, 
it was too long. First of all, I mean, you know, after an hour, your your backside falls asleep, and and uh, you know they 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 should have cut it sh- shorter. But uh, his information was, was excellent. But you know, it's he really. He, well, he wasn't saying anything, if, if if you know what I mean. Well, I've heard him before, and the problem is that he has a point where he can't go any further, but he has enough verbiage to be able to cover it up. And yeah. like I said, I was I was really upset that I couldn't get to go to that meeting, although I doubt that I could have gotten heard asking what I would have liked to have said yeah. in, in, in a question-and-answer uh, roundtable. But part of the problem is that the deniability stories are still out there. In other words, people like John Alexander, however sincere he may be, he may believe his story, but the truth of the matter is, at this point, the argument sways on the side now that there has been a massive cover-up that the government knows about this. Too many ex-military people have come out and said they knew about the projects, they knew what was going on out in the desert at Area 51, what was going on in Dulce, what's been going on at bases all over the country, including down here in, in Maryland, um, probably in New Jersey and New York as well. All these secret projects that have gone on, the compartmentalization is breaking down. And that's one of the things that... Um, I think people who are investigating need to push hard for us to find credible witnesses and get this data on the table. Oh yeah, yeah you're exactly right. Yeah, that was a uh, uh, that was UFO Com 13. That was by uh, Aerial Phenomenon dot uh, org. I belong to that organization. As a matter of fact, I'm a senior investigator with Aerial Phenomenon um, Investigations, but I haven't had time to help them out because I've been too busy in New Jersey. But Antonio Paris, he's the director of the Aerial Phenomenon, and he did it. Wonderful job and on the conference. Uh, everything seemed to go very smoothly, and it was uh, very enjoyable. Um, one final question that I have for you, and I'll, I want, I'll let Chris do the final round here as we wrap things up. You're not bashful about talking about extraterrestrial presence. Why? Do, why are you convinced, and why are you bold enough to be able to say that when, for the most part? The organizations that represent ufology, including MUFON, generally shy away from that type of statement. Well, I've uh, I have five sightings myself. I have an, had an encounter down at the back gates of Area 51. I, I've I've just seen too many um, uh, photos that that you know were were are just incredible, and I, I think we sh- we should take the next step and and like you find they will only let you uh, classify a case as unknown i think it's about time we step up and start classifying some cases as identified alien craft i mean unknown of course is an unidentified fine object and and you know the word identify but i think a lot of these things are identified and yet are identified alien craft so i i think Mufon, I think it's it's time that uh, not 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 so much Mufon, but the whole UFO community, we're we're ready to take that next step, and uh, I, I think we have to um, do this whole ufology thing. Uh, we got to have to start from scratch and, and do it better, essentially. I agree, and uh, thanks for for saying that because that's a that's a strong bold statement. Chris, anything else you wanna you wanna cover here? Not, I don't, we don't have time. I would need another at least two hours show with Ken. Well, then we'll do that again. We'll bring Ken back again. Yeah. Yeah. Because I want to hear a lot more. I would love to have you back, Ken. Um, Anytime. And we'll, 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 we've gotten kind of the preliminaries out of the way tonight, and we will bring you back very soon. Um, Chris, let people know about what's upcoming in our schedule. You won't be here next week, but the next two shows um, you have booked guests for. Yes, the one is the Kate Valentine, who runs a uh, AM radio show about UFOs here in the tri-state area, New Jersey, Long Island, you know, New York, and I'm not sure where else it, it goes. Who has lots of information because all she does is talk about UFOs on her radio show. She'll be joining us, and she's a bright, a woman who I'm sure will have lots to tell us and talk about. Um, That's May 29th. That's right. And after that, we have 
from Nocturnal Frequency Radio, uh, the co-host Steve Guineer coming on. He had a, an amazing experience with a creature. That, that's that's uh, uh, what it was. It was a creature on a bridge in Canada, and he's going to tell us all about that and how he's tried to investigate it, and we have uh, other creature sightings that we're going to talk about. And then following that, I'm not sure, Randy, where did we, we were also going to do a second show with him in the summer um, about ghosts, because they've yeah. been going to old ancient uh, burial grounds and in places that are known to be haunted in Canada, and they're finding some really unusual things. And they are not the typical, they go to places and try to discount what it could be to really get down to the nitty gritty to know that they're dealing with something that's unknown. So they're interesting, and we'll be talking with them. And we're going to be doing um, a segment on the chemtrails, which my poor husband's been sent out to take photos of the skies along over Long Island now for about a week, and he's going to do so until they get a full range of the different skies that I look at that are all unusual to me, including, I hope, I get a lot of chemtrail photos. And we'll be discussing that along with the heart machines. And where else... <laughs> Things will take us. I'm not yet sure. We don't so know, but we're going to talk about. We've got a lot, a lot of exciting times ahead of us, um, and so I welcome you, Chris, as uh, the new co-host on Off Planet Radio. And Ken, give your websites out one more time so people know where they can go to find thousands of UFO photographs. Uh, yes, it's uh, worldufophotos.org. Uh, my my article website. I have about a thousand articles on there. It's uh, worldufophotosandnews.org, and I have another website. I have like seven or eight websites. Uh, another website is www.bufonnjnews.com, and I'm the founder of a religious uh, organization that would be heavensrangers.net. So uh, cool. yeah. I, an honor. I want to thank uh, thank you guys for Chris and Randy for having me on your show. It was an honor, and, and uh, I, I hope you have me back soon. We will indeed. And, Absolutely. Uh, and we will be back next week again uh, with my guest Denise Stoner and Kathleen Morden and the Alien Abduction Files. That will be next Wednesday night on Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It's inside you, and we all need to keep looking for it stay tuned we will have the after show with Duncan and Miranda coming up in a few minutes good night